Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, City Council takes up the question of San Diego's minimum wage. And another major bank agrees to pay major bucks in connection with the subprime mortgage crisis. California is in for a chunk of the money. And we'll take a look at what's new and how you can help homeless veterans at San Diego's annual stand down. Plus, why are you friends with some people and not others? New research reveals the answer could be found in you and your pal's DNA. I'm Peggy Pico with those conversations just ahead. And a bit of rolling thunder at Freedom Station today, all to help wounded warriors. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego City Council is taking up the minimum wage debate tonight, deciding whether to put a wage increase before city voters. The proposal from Council President Todd Gloria would raise the minimum wage from nine bucks an hour to nine seventy five by the end of the year. It would gradually increase to eleven fifty an hour by twenty seventeen. Now business leaders and the Chamber of Commerce are opposing the plan. Citigroup has agreed to pay $7 billion to settle a federal investigation into its handling of risky subprime mortgages. Now, California will get a large chunk of this settlement. We begin our coverage tonight with AP's Warren Levinson. Citigroup is paying $7 billion to settle a federal investigation into subprime mortgages that helped bring about the financial crisis. The bank's activities shattered lives and livelihoods throughout the country and also around the world. City, along with other banks, packaged questionable loans into securities and sold them to investors. Despite the fact that Citigroup learned of serious and widespread defects among the increasingly risky loans that they were securitizing, the bank and its employees concealed these defects. The settlement will pay $4 billion to state and federal authorities. Two and a half billion will be allotted to consumers for principal reduction and financing for affordable housing. J.P. Morgan Chase agreed to pay $13 billion last year in a similar case. The Justice Department says other investigations are underway. Analysts say the government probes are helping to rein in the banking industry in the wake of the financial crisis. Banks are becoming safer and safer. Uh, more like utilities, um, and as the risk uh, taking is pared back. Investors reacted positively to the ruling, sending shares up sharply after the announcement. Warren Levinson, Associated Press. California is getting close to $200 million of the settlement. Just over half of it will reimburse the state's pension funds for public employees and teachers. Both suffered losses on investments in mortgage backed securities and at least $90 million will be used for consumer relief. State Attorney General Kamala Harris says the settlement does not absolve Citigroup or its employees from possible criminal charges. PBS NewsHour will have more on the settlement coming up at 7. The head of the Highway Patrol says his officers need more training on dealing with people who are mentally ill. The agency is investigating an incident earlier this month where an officer hit a woman repeatedly on the side of a freeway in Los Angeles. That woman is mentally ill. Highway Patrol officers currently undergo about 12 hours of training on dealing with the mentally ill. CHP's commissioner wants to increase it to 40 hours. A new survey of school district construction bonds here shows more transparency. San Diego County Taxpayers Association rated 19 districts on how well they make information available to the public. It shows the school districts met 90 percent of the criteria, up from 80 percent in 2011. The bond programs came under fire about two years ago after reports Poway Unified would pay $981 million for a loan of $105 million. Advocates of a plan to split California into six new states say they have enough signatures tonight to make the ballot. Now, under this plan, San Diego would be grouped into South California, along with Imperial, Riverside, Orange, and San Bernardino counties. A venture capitalist from Northern California is behind the initiative. He says California is too big and too ungovernable. He plans to turn his petitions in tomorrow in hopes of making the ballot in November 2016. Several U.S. lawmakers are proposing bills to speed up deportations of Central American children who cross the border illegally and without an adult. Now, the bills differ in some details, but generally speaking, would 
allow Border Patrol agents to treat the children like they were from Mexico and send them back more quickly across the border unless they can convince agents they have a fear of returning. Currently, those children have to stay and wait for a hearing because they are from a non-bordering country. Some state lawmakers here are headed to Central America for a fact-finding mission. Senate leader Daryl Steinberg is going with five others. The trip was planned months ago, but now they'll focus on the immigration crisis. Steinberg says they may come back with some recommendations about how California can deal with the situation. Mission Trails Regional Park was closed today while fire crews mopped up from a wildfire. It burned 95 acres in Mission Trails uh, yesterday. As of late this afternoon, the fire was about 95 percent surrounded. About 200 firefighters fought the flames along with two planes and multiple helicopters. One firefighter suffered heat-related injuries. The cause is still under investigation tonight. The fire department says Mission Trails will be fully open tomorrow. For the 27th year, the Stand Down for Homeless Veterans takes place this week in San Diego. Peggy Pico finds out what's new this year and how you can help. Stand Down San Diego began in 1988. It was named and modeled after the Stand Down concept used in the Vietnam War to provide a safe retreat for returning combat units. Here with what this year's event has to offer San Diego's homeless veterans are my guest, Phil Landis, president and CEO of San Diego's Veteran Village, and John Natchison, co-founder of Stand Down. Welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. John, remind us who Stand Down is trying to help and the range of services that are offered. Well, this is really directed for veterans who are on the street, um, but we recognize that that also means family members as well. So it's veterans, spouses, partners, and children. Um, that's who we're trying to help, and, and uh, the services really are anything that we can think of. In fact, over the years, the number of services have increased. Um, but the basic services are there for food, clothing, shelter, medical, dental, um, but now you can get a massage, you can get acupuncture, uh, you can get all kinds of help. Um, and um, Phil, uh, San Diego's downtown homeless shelter uh, closed last month. What impact has that had on homeless veterans? Well, that's a remarkable process that we've had here. It was open for 19 continuous months of service. What we found was 1,148 individual veterans participated in that shelter experience over this 19 months. That's an astounding number. Well, I know that uh, California voters passed Prop 41 in June, which would allocate more uh, money for veterans' housing. What would you like to see as far as the top priorities of how that money would be used? Well, I'd like to see more permanent housing. Uh, think of them as apartments, apartment-style housing. Uh, uh, what's really important here is not to have an apartment complex with a few veterans in it, but rather one contiguous building or set of buildings where you create a campus so that you can have veterans that live in that campus, if you will, because they all support each other. And John, I know Veterans Village of San Diego is part of a 25-city national initiative aimed at ending, ending chronic uh, homelessness. Uh, Mayor Faulkner is part of that program, and he's actually committed to trying to end homelessness for veterans in the next two years. He's, he said that. What's the first thing that has to happen to make that a reality? Well, I think the first th steps have already been taken. And uh, the first step really started with our stand down back in 1988, which is to say, hey, we have a problem. Um, stand down was in San Diego was the first place in the country to really say that there are veterans living on the street and it's disgraceful. Now what's happening is agencies are getting involved and they're connecting with each other. They're working together. I think that that's very, very important. Somewhere along the line, the fo folks who have been homeless, who are veterans, need to be part of this initiative. I think any initiative that's just done for people is not going to be nearly as effective as one that is actually able to enlist folks who have been there to reach back and help others. And Phil, what would you say to that? If, if you could uh, allocate this money and with a wand, how would you like to see it, uh, some of the top priorities? Well, actually, we have a wand, and we're, uh, you know, we're waving it mm -hmm. madly. Uh, we're going to build a, a facility and some land that we own in Escondido 
be a 64 unit, 138 beds specifically for veterans. But Dr. John touched upon the, the critical component and that's services. You don't want to just put some folks there and then leave them alone and forget about them. In isolation, you want to be able to, to maintain a high level of case management and services. Um, and how can someone help with this year's stand down? Is there still time to help? Well, there's always time to help, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you want to volunteer, you can reach us through our website. Uh, you have to go through a couple of hoops, but it's worth it. And uh, get on our volunteer line and we'll find a place for you. And uh, Phil, what would you say about for people saying, all right, we, we have one of the highest populations of homeless veterans here in San Diego. I, is there one particular thing that we need to do as a city, as a community to help these veterans? You know, I, I, th I think that uh, we're doing it. I think that, well, San Diego comes out and shows their love for veterans and homeless veterans that stand down every year. As, I, as I've looked back over the years, I've just seen this incredible outpouring from this community to help it stand down. The best thing that anybody can do, though, is to give folks a chance. When they leave stand down, we really try and get many of them to the point where they're job ready. Not everybody, but there's a lot that are there. Um, so that, that would be a good way to, to start. And we're yes. out of time, so I want to let folks know that Stand Down San Diego takes place uh, this Friday. For more information, go to kpbs.org. Uh, John Nackinson and uh, Phil Landis, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. An Army veteran pulled into Freedom Station in San Diego after a cross-country ride. It took Stephen Woodcock... Less than seven days to ride his Harley from Conway, New Hampshire to San Diego, all to raise awareness and funds for the Warrior Foundation Freedom Station, a local nonprofit providing temporary housing for injured and disabled veterans. Woodcock says he was encouraged to do it by his daughter who lives here. Now San Diego is home to the largest population of vets returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. So I set uh, seven days, seven K as my goal which was to get here in less than seven days from New Hampshire on my motorcycle and raise $7,000, and I was fortunate to be able to do both. Freedom Station is designed specifically for seriously injured veterans returning home from war. It provides guidance and resources to help recover and transition back into civilian life. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Comedian John Oliver on turning last week's news into laughs. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, the medicine go down, medicine go down. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down in a most delightful way. Yeah, that spoon may be all right for sugar, but some new research says it's probably not the best thing for medicine. A report in the journal Pediatrics says 40% of parents make significant errors when they measure medication for their kids, and they're twice as likely to make mistakes when the doses are measured in spoonfuls. The problem, spoons come in lots of different sizes, and what you pull out of your silverware drawer may not be anything close to the correct measurement. Researchers say it would be best to stick with syringes or droppers in metric measurements to give your child just the right amount of medicine. Then you can follow it up with a spoonful of sugar if you like. Here's another story from Pediatrics, a report of an 11-year-old San Diego boy getting a rash from his iPad. The boy has an allergy to nickel used on the outside coating of his family's iPad. Once the device went into a protective case, no more rash. Apple isn't commenting, but a spokeswoman for the wireless industry says nickel isn't widely used for outer coatings because it can block signals. A San Diego researcher finds your DNA may influence who you choose as your friends. We get more on that from Peggy Pico. The study found DNA similarities between friends, especially when it comes to the senses, like sharing a similar sense of smell. The report was co-authored by my guest, James Fowler, professor of medical genetics and political science at UC San Diego. And welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. Now, James, your study asked the question whether genes played a role in friends uh, being alike. What did you find? We found out actually that friends are more genetically similar than strangers. And this is over and above the tendency for us to make 
make friends with people of the same ancestry. You know, for example, white people making friends with white people. And in fact, the level of similarity is so strong. It's as though friends who don't share any ancestors in common are actually genetically related. In fact, the level of genetic relatedness is about what you would expect between two people who are fourth cousins, people who share a great, great, great grandparent in common. How did you find this out? How did you conduct the study? Well, we used uh, a lot of genetic information and social network information from the Framingham Heart Study, which is a study that's been going on for more than 60 years. And we basically took about 30 years worth of social data, who was friends with whom, and we compared it to people's genes. How much of an influence does a person's DNA, did you find, play in friends' likes and dislikes? We both like the same movies, or we both dislike a uh, certain, I don't know, food. Well, we tried to look for lots of different kinds of traits that that, that might be in common among the genes that we have in, in, in common with our friends. And one of the things that we found is that we tend to smell the things the same way that our friends do. The genes for smelling are similar between friends. And which genes were um, really least likely to be linked to our friends? Well, we actually found that genes tend to have opposite. Our friends tend to have opposite genes um, when it comes to the immune system. And this is really interesting because it's sort of like what other researchers have found for spouses. Spouses also tend to have different immune system genes. And the reason why is you want your spouse to be able to defend you against all the things that you might be susceptible to. You don't want them getting a deadly disease that's also going to make you sick. Interesting. The, um you, how did your similar genes among friends compare to, let's say, you were saying fourth cousins, but let's say compared to um, uh, brothers and sisters or first cousins, what, what is the description that you see there as far as uh, in layman's terms? Yeah, so um, brothers and sisters, they share about half of their genes in, in common. Um, cousins, it goes down to an eighth. And so every time you go out, you, you, you lose about a quarter of, of what's, what's remaining. And so fourth cousins, it gets really, really small indeed. But this is really, really important for theories of evolution because always before we just thought, you know, if we're strangers, then we share nothing in common. And, and actually, friends are sort of like the family that we choose. Is there any idea on how um you would have a, a same similar DNA as a friend that you really have no uh, familial association with. Yeah, so say for example, there are genes that influence our, our smell of coffee. Uh, and you really love the smell of coffee and you walk like a zombie into the Starbucks, <laughs> right. you know, looking for, for a, a cup. You're gonna be all the other people who have that same tendency there. And those are gonna be the people that you're more likely to become friends with. So that's one possibility. But another possibility is that you actually like drinking coffee so much that, that you consciously say, oh, you know, that's one of the things I wanna check off the list for what I think of as a good friend. I wanna make friends with coffee drinkers. Either one of those, those things could be driving the similarity that we found in this study. How would you like to see this information used? Well, I would really like to see larger studies so we have a better idea of, of what the underlying biology of choosing friends is like. You know, one of the fascinating things about studying social networks is that we have found that they're similar all around the world. Even in hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, they tend to have similar networks. And so we're just really fascinated with where did friendship come from? Why do we as a species exhibit this property of spending so much time with people that are not our mates and not our kin? So this is um, this is something that you've been working on, and, and you're talking about this. Why why do we have friends? Is there anything else you want to know about as far as DNA when it comes to relationships, perhaps spouses or you know uh, great grandchildren or something like that? Yeah, we do plan to study spouses next, and I think we're going to find some some similar things. And I also think this is going to help us to understand evolution. Right now, our theories of evolution are all about you know what's good for you and how does that impact whether or not you survive. But if you think about someone who, for example, all of a sudden can speak a language because they got a certain genes for that combination. It's not going to do them any good whatsoever if they just have it themselves. They need to have a friend who speaks the language as well. And so I think there are a lot of things that help to explain how we are as a species that are about these social network effects. And it's going to be really important for us to understand who we are to be able to take those things into account. All right, Professor James Fowler, thanks so much for this information. Thank you. We all want the best for our kids, and in some cases, they end up living out our dreams. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler has this story of a father who survived fleeing his country as a refugee and then raised his children to become Gates scholars. Mira Mesa resident Michael Million is a proud father. <laughs> they all that like that. <laughs> he raised two kids alone. Now they're both Bill and Melinda Gates scholarship winners. It's a major achievement for Michael Million and part of his story of survival and resilience. I actually left Ethiopia in 1976. 
Michael Million grew up middle class in pre-Marxist Ethiopia. He was fortunate and smart enough to be able to attend a prestigious British school. I always wanted to be a doctor, but that dream was extinguished a long time ago. In 1976, the year he was supposed to graduate from high school, revolution broke out. We were forced out, and a lot of us fled out of the country because of that. So I never got a chance to go back to college. And a lot of people like me, I was a 12th grader then, I literally had to leave the country, cross the border to Kenya. Million fled Ethiopia and ended up in San Diego nearly 30 years ago. He married, had two children, Miriam and Daniel, but it was a rocky road. I had a Subway sandwich store, and uh, but uh, things didn't work out. About four years ago, we were forced out. The marriage broke up, but the kids stayed with him. Now a single dad, Michael was on the lookout for anything to give his kids an advantage. He wanted them to have the opportunities he lost. After sixth grade, we found out about the school pros, and uh, I wanted to get her in there. I was in a waiting list for a year for her. Both Daniel and Miriam eventually got a place in the Preuss School, a unique charter school run by UC San Diego. It's for kids who aim to be the first in their family to go to college. The faculty and staff at Preuss are deeply invested in their students' success. Daniel remembers when things got a little bit tough for him and his counselor immediately stepped in. My grades were actually slipping a little bit. So when he saw that my grades were slipping, like on like a progress report, he would like come to me and be like, oh, what's, what's going on here? And I had to talk to him about it. Every student at Preuss has a counselor, one counselor from the first day to the last. But Michael Million stayed closely involved in his children's education. And being accepted at that school is not enough unless you do your share as a parent and a student to excel in that school. Miriam won a Gates scholarship and went to college. It was a bit harder for Daniel. There were challenges, definitely. You know, the young men here, there have a lot of distractions. Definitely Facebook was a challenge. Form, phones were a challenge. And maybe a little bit girls were a challenge, but, but that's growing up in America. I mean, he's lucky enough to have those problems. Daniel says he was inspired by his sister's success and his father's commitment. So I feel like just, you know, all I've done in like high school and like, you know, the family I come from, like my dad and like my sister, I've seen like my sister do all this like amazing stuff at Johns Hopkins and I feel like, you know, it just comes down to pushing myself. And he really surprised me. He caught on and I was really strong on him, pushing him to do good at school and he did very well. Now Daniel is the second student in the family to win a Gates scholarship. He's heading to USC and hopes to be a doctor. Michael looks back on leaving Ethiopia, coming to San Diego, and raising two great kids. I did the best I could. Matt Bowler, KPBS News. A lot of Americans were watching the World Cup final Sunday, especially right here in San Diego. Here are the top five markets for watching. Germany and Argentina battle it out. Of course, Germany won it. San Diego ranks second, right behind Washington, D.C. Ratings were higher here than in Los Angeles, San Francisco, even New York. Our chance of thunderstorms is fading. Still cloudy, though, along the coast for the next few days with just a bit of afternoon sunshine. Temperatures mostly in the low to mid-70s. Inland Valley's low 80s for the... Uh, Next few days after the morning clouds, clearing to afternoon sunshine there. Lots of sun uh, and uh, temperatures in the low 80s for the mountain areas. And once again, triple digits for the desert with plenty of sunshine. Let's recap tonight's top story. San Diego City Council is taking up the minimum wage debate, deciding tonight whether to put a wage increase before city voters. The proposal from Council President Todd Gloria would raise the minimum wage from the current nine bucks an hour to 975 by the end of the year it would gradually increase to 1150 an hour by 2017 business leaders and the chamber of commerce are opposing the plan citigroup has agreed to pay seven billion dollars to settle a federal investigation into its handling of subprime mortgages those loans helped create the financial crisis the bank's activities shattered lives and livelihoods throughout the country and also around the world California is getting close to $200 million of the settlement. Just over half of it will reimburse the state's pension funds for public employees and for teachers. Both suffered losses in investments in mortgage-backed securities. And at least $90 million will be used for consumer relief. 
Our state attorney general, Kamala Harris, says the settlement does not absolve Citigroup or its employees from possible criminal charges. Several U.S. lawmakers are proposing bills to speed up deportations of Central American children flooding across the border. The bills differ in some details, but generally would allow Border Patrol agents to treat the children like they were from Mexico and send them back over the border more quickly unless they can convince agents they have a fear of returning. Currently, these children have to stay and wait for a hearing because they are from a non-bordering country. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.